and welcome to the Advanced Age Role Play Gamers podcast. I'm Nathan. I'm your one of your co-hosts today, and I've got with me uh, Matt. Say hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. That's his joke. We do this every time. Anybody who's watched our interviews is probably really sick and tired of that by now. But it's uh, a good joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, today we've got uh, the the creators behind uh, Coriolis and the new uh, Kickstarter for. I'm gonna get this wrong. The Great Dark. Uh, Nils, That's me. Nils and Costa. Hi. And they're from Free League Publishing. Uh, so, uh, guys, uh, if you can give me uh, just a quick bit about yourselves, uh, how you, maybe how you got started uh, gaming and, and what you uh, uh, do at Free League and other products. So, you just, you know, just first couple of minutes here just let's sure. get to know you a little bit i can uh, i can start mm-hmm. um so i'm nils i'm one of the co-founders of free league uh it was founded back in 2009 i think um something like that and we actually were founded because of uh me and costa's work with the first uh published edition of coriolis which was another company mm. back in 2008 so this is kind of coming back to the roots for us uh, but uh, I've been uh, playing uh, tabletop RPG since I was five years old. My father introduced uh, uh, Dragon Bane, actually, or Drocker and the Mourner, as it was called then, mm-hmm. to me in the Christmas of 82. So I've been playing for quite a while. Wow. Uh, and it's been like one of the main hobbies of my life, probably the main hobby. So being able to work with this full time is like crazy. It's like a d- dream come true. That's excellent. That's, you know, I think we talked to a lot of folks, and that's uh, everybody's dream. Uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, everybody can can get there. But it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, a a lot of a lot of hope out there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, as Nils said, uh, we started working with Coriolis. I actually started a bit before Nils working yeah. as a freelancer for the old company, Yanring, and writing a setting for Coriolis in two thousand eight or something. Uh, we actually met that way, yeah. Because I had to, to audition to his group to oh. get to play Coriolis yeah. at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <That's> stupid. <laughs> anyway, uh, I started playing when I was fourteen, so it was like in nineteen eighty-seven. Same game as Neil Struck in the Morning mm-hmm. uh, with some friends in school, us uh, the the nerds, and <laughs> and I never stopped playing. Actually, uh, a few years I had a, a hiatus, you could say. Yeah, uh, Matt and I met in in high school uh, and started playing uh, like D and D together. But uh, uh, our group, if if anybody watching this doesn't know, we've been uh, we're about uh, seven episodes in on a uh, 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 so far recorded twenty five episodes of of Dragon Bane, and we've been having so much fun. Uh, probably the reason why it's, it's gone so long. Most of our our eight, uh, actual plays are like 11 to 15 episodes. So uh, this much dragging me is, is great. It's, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air. Uh, I, I love the setting. I love the uh, the, the play. It's, it's Anyway, not here to talk about Dragon Bane, but uh, every time I, anybody brings it up, I have to gush about it. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, so s- the setting for Coriolis, it's a, uh, I've heard it described as... Oh, I just lost my brain for a second there. Um, like a thousand and one uh, Arabian the, Nights in yeah, space. Yeah, Arabian Nights. So I've, I've heard it described as, as Arabian Nights in space. Uh, so is was that like an, an intentional thing, or is that just some something somebody said once and you kind of latched on to it? Or, or, uh... It's both, I think. It's actually because in the first, very first edition of Coriolis, that part was not as emphasized as in the second, our version, which yeah. was... The Third Rising. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was uh, influence of um, especially Eastern mythology and history, and culture in in the aesthetics of the first edition, uh, and in our version, Third Rising, we took that and ramped it up a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it was mostly. I mean, it is the main thing with Coriolis. Uh, I think is that it's it's not based on Anglo-Saxon Western mythology. That's the main thing. Uh, this Arabian Nights is one thing to kind of convey that it's a different uh, cultural 
um, cornerstone or background, mm, but it's, yeah. it was never specifically Arabian Nights. It was never specifically about that part. It was just kind okay. of the, the feeling. Yeah. The high level pitch, I would say. Yes. Yeah. So it was a high level pitch. Arabian Night meets Firefly. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. Gets <laughs> I, yeah. That, I, that I like that too. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that only brings a, an image to my head. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so it, yeah, yeah. It, it kind of took out on its life of its own. Uh, but for us, it was never kind of, that wasn't the core of the game. It was a big part of the game. Uh, but uh, yeah. So first, probably the first and probably only really uh, tough question I have for you is, is how do you borrow from these other cultures that you might not be a part of and do that in a res- respectful and kind of egalitarian manner? That's a super tricky question yeah. and a good question. Yeah, I know. That's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's one actually, tricky question. And that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that's, it's a good question. Uh, and I mean, that, uh, it's kind of one way in why we're kind of toning it down a bit for this game. Um, mm-hmm. We still want to have it in the background. We still want to have it based on the old game, but we don't want to go full on in this kind of diving into another culture where we don't really know all the different different aspects of it. Yeah. So, so, but in the in the old game, we we were more going for the aesthetics of it, yeah. and we're basing it on the mythology and not on, um, for example, there's no. Uh, Islam is not part of the old game. It's not like real religions. It's not like no. real uh, history. And, based and when Jan Ringen developed the first game, they were very uh, adamant that they shouldn't have churches or synagogues or, or minarets mm-hmm. or anything. They, everything was called temples. There should be re- religion, but, but it shouldn't be specified to anything you could get from Earth, so to say. Yeah. But okay. the feeling that there's something mystic, something out there. Yeah, but it, it is a very good question. I mean, and that's something we've been pondering quite a bit ourselves, uh, of course. So, so uh, we don't really have a straight cut answer to it, except that do it uh, carefully and with respect, and try to kind of figure out what we're looking for. And in our in our case, in this game's case, it's just making it feel a bit different than to uh, all the other science fiction games that are based on kind of this Western kind of. Feeling. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that's, and that's a good goal too, is, is, uh, even like a lot of the fantasy games are heavily based on, on Western mythos and, and aesthetic. So, uh, I, I definitely think that's, um, a, a pretty good goal for, especially for a science fiction game. Um, so there's, there's, uh, you know, I really like the expanse for the way they, uh, treat that, that, uh, whole aspect. So, um, I think Dune is an, another example that yeah, tries yeah. to do that and does it very well, where they go for this kind of clearly inspired by uh, Eastern uh, history and mythology, but not particularly anything of that. And that's kind of the same same kind of vibe um, yeah, we, okay. we're going for. And a, yes. a lot of inspiration is also historical from uh, Byzantium and uh, and. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean area, sort of historically or in the antique. Yeah, one thing mm. that's actually a good thing because one thing that's kind of fallen off people's radar is that uh, we used the Arabian Nights as the, kind of the high level pitch, but mm-hmm. a lot of the culture and the aesthetics was inspired by uh, Greece. Mm. Uh, mm. Costa is Greek himself, so kind of that was a big part of it, and also uh, Byzantium, as you said, mm. and Constantinople, um, that part. So there's there's has been different parts of uh, the world that has influenced kind of the feeling of it, not just one part. Yeah, that's, that's good. So um, in a quick background for the folks watching too, uh, I have not personally played uh, Coriolis. Um, that's, I'm going to leave a, a lot of that Coriolis specific stuff t- uh, to Matt. I've gone through, there's a, a quick start uh, available now through their Kickstarter page that you can download, and, and there's uh, pre-gen characters already in there you can try out, which is pretty cool. And I'm, I've been going through that. So there's uh, uh, for folks that we'll start off with uh, for folks that are not familiar with with, with Coriolis. So we've gone a little bit about the uh, into about the setting. Um, what are the types of uh, scenarios, adventures, uh, and even like uh, uh, archetypes uh, are they gonna, uh, should they expect in a Coriolis game? So, so we we want the adventures to have like three parts. 
We want to have uh, intrigue, which is in the beginning when you set up an expedition and when you travel through space where different factions interact with each other and with the PCs uh, to get uh, favors from each other. Mm -hmm. But it's also about uh, um, exploration and delving into ruins and finding, uh, solving mysteries from the past. And that's the later part of an adventure. So you okay. should get all these parts in an adventure, both intrigue, expeditions, and also delving down into ruins. Okay. That's the aim. Yeah. And yeah, that's and it, oh yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just saying for, for folks who maybe have not played any of the Coriolis before, um, so the the setting that, that I have that I'm more familiar with is is based around it's basically this, you know, if I butcher something wrong, I'm sorry. Like, you know, humanity has spread to what they call the third horizon, right? And that's a, a place in space. And I think the, most of the adventures are sent around a large space station, right? Coriolis, yep. right? Yep. Which was the built from the hulk of one of the ships that that brought humanity there, right? And there's like a couple different waves of humanity, and that that's that cultural tension, right? Yep. Yep. But in uh, the great, this is you're talking about these uh, going out on these explorations. So maybe you could. So if folks aren't familiar, that's what it is. But this new uh, version kind of changes the setting and, and sort of and, and kind of the feel. Maybe you can just kind of let folks know what they sure. can expect in this new version. Yeah. I mean, the new version, basically, it takes place about 200 years uh, after the, the old one. The old one has this epic campaign that changes up a lot of things. Um, so this uh, is basically kind of an offshoot of that. And basically, the old setting, as you said, was called the Third Horizon. Um, and uh, Horizon is like a cluster of star systems. And this setting is called uh, the Lost Horizon. And people from the former Horizon fled to this one during a big uh, calamity. Uh, so this could be called the Fourth Horizon or the Lost Horizon. It doesn't matter. But it's, it's another uh, star cluster. This one is more... Uh, is less open, it's more mysterious, and it's dotted with these huge ruins from the portal builders that existed in the old as well. But this seems closer to kind of their home. Uh, mm -hmm. And when, when the humanity comes to this one, escaping uh, stuff in the third horizon, they kind of get stranded here because there's no portals. All the portals that people use to travel between systems are dead in, in this horizon. And they seem to be dead for some reason, which is part of the mystery you're going to explore. So this is a this uh, the new setting is a more frontier feeling, a more dangerous feeling, a more, more gritty feeling uh, than the older one, which was more kind of a golden age kind of thing with with this cultural tension, as you said. Um, this one has the cultural thing in, as well, uh, but its humanity and civilization is more uh, small scale. Mm. Um, so you kind of you kind of help building this new kind of part of humanity to to uh, survive in this new difficult uh, environment. And this game is about hope. The former game was basically about faith, um, mm. about religion, and this game is more about hope, which faith could be a part of. But but it's not specifically about religion. It's it's more about pulling together and doing stuff together and kind of creating a new home mm -hmm. for humanity. So it's, it's a shift in tone. It's a shift in a setting uh, where the setting is starts smaller, but you, when you go out and explore and, and, and explore it, it's going to open up That's you're going to mm -hmm. see about much more. Mm -hmm. And the, the main reason we did this was that the old game, which we love, of course, we wrote it uh, is that that's basically a huge sandbox. We, Lots of different uh, factions and cultures and planets, but there's no clear cut focus of the game, so it's very difficult to write material for it. Uh, it's like a traveler in that sense. It's like a huge sandbox. You can do anything with it, uh, but you can't really do any focus development because people will have different play styles, different play groups. You can play a traveling circus. You can play pilgrims. You can play yeah. uh, mercenaries, mm. um, and that's cool. But it's it's not a game that's easy to develop for. Uh, so we wanted to kind of make this game a bit more focused and a bit more focused on what we think is the sci-fi and the mystery parts, which mm -hmm. was always, the old game was supposed to be about that. And that is the mystery of the builders. Yeah. 
we were intrigued by those uh, parts of the old setting when we first started writing about the portrait builders. Where did they go? But this was never touched upon in the Third Horizon. That no. the, the, the adventures were more about uh, war and espionage and, and Firefly and kind of game. Yeah. yeah. So the, the old game is much more Firefly esque. Yeah. Uh, and that's a cool thing. But we, there's lots of space games doing Firefly kind of, I mean, Star Wars and all of them, mm, yeah. uh, when you zip around in a small spaceship. And we wanted to kind of change this one so it's more based on 19th century uh, polar expedition and, and ocean-faring vessels. Yeah, okay. and, so. and, right. and a frontier feeling where civilization hasn't spread. So the high-level pitch is the terror, the series meets Deadwood, although there are no <laughs> co cowboys. It's a frontier yeah. feeling of Deadwood. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a whole, it's kind of a romantic take on, on sci-fi in that the, the, we call it the great dark. Obviously, the great dark is space and the mm -hmm. great dark is the sea. It is the sea of, of the old uh, polar explorers. And it's dark and it's wild and it's dangerous. And going out on these journeys is going to be an adventure in itself. Uh, so we tried to make this, setting, this game a bit more about uh, the exploration and about the, 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 the romantic parts of, of the setting, we think. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I, and I can I definitely. Explore, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I can definitely feel the uh, when you you keep mentioning the, the the frontier setting and just going through the quick start. I can kind of see that because uh, if you're going from a, a golden age to the frontier, one of the things you, you lose out on are resources. Um, and I see that there's a whole supply resource management uh, aspect uh, just just even in the, in the quick start. Uh, yeah. So can you talk about, uh, talk about why you put the, I mean, I, I can kind of see why you put that in there, but can you t talk about that uh, mechanic a little bit? The yeah. Supply uh, mechanic? Supply, I think it comes from, we've been very inspired by uh, deep sea diving and mountaineering and those kind of mm -hmm. uh, vertical uh, exploration things that you have instead of a lot of games have, you come to a, a place it could be a dungeon, it could be a space station, whatever, and go around in a top-down map. Uh, we wanted to kind of focus more about going downwards or upwards and kind of uh, into the unknown. And supply mm -hmm. here is a thing to kind of make the PCs feel limited in what they can do, forcing, forcing important choices. Yeah. So if your supplies are running low, you have to make a choice. Should we go left or right? Or should we explore that cave or that cave? Or should we, what should we do? Should we split up? Um, so it's a way of making sure that you have this urgency when you're exploring, mm, yeah. uh, which is also, I mean, the real life explorers have that. They have yeah. to make yeah. sure they have re resources and, and food yeah. and so on. So it's yeah. a way of making cool. Yeah, it's not like a, a dungeon where, you, you know, we go to every, through every room looking for a treasure. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You you have to you have to decide. Okay, this is, how far can we go before we have to turn back around? And yeah, yeah. But this yeah. part is only used when you're out exploring ruins or in dangerous places. When you're in, for example, Ship City, which is the equivalent of Coriolis in this game, um, it's a big station. Uh, you don't use supply rules, of course. Uh, or mm -hmm. if you are on, on a big ship going out, there's not supply rules for for your group. It's going to be other stuff. Yeah. So it's just this is a mechanic that we wanted to uh, create uh, for kind of emphasize the the feeling of delving into the unknown and kind of uh, yeah forcing hard changes yeah choices yeah and that's Spaces, all part yeah. of the whole delving sorry, that's <laughs> sorry. Right. I'll I'll I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll let you go in a second <laughs> we need like a we need like a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, red light, right. right? But so this is all part of the. So you've got the 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 home base setting. You've got the exploration portion, and then you have the the delving and the supply mm -hmm. um, aspect as part of the the delving system that that you're talking about uh, exploring uh, up and down vertical um, uh, situations. So uh, that. And so the, I'm taking that that whole mechanic at, uh, or s idea wasn't even part of the whole the old Third Horizon Coriolis. This is something new to uh, to the Great Dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and what we've changed to is uh, we've taken away the Firefly part in a, in a big part. Mm -hmm. So now when you travel, 
between star systems, you have to go on great ships. Like in the explorers, they had a ship with a big crew with different mm-hmm. uh, tasks during the travel through the dark. And you have to, and you can, all, in that way, you can also bring the intrigue from, from your homestead with you. So the different factions can continue doing intriguing okay. stuff during the whole trip out, which should take weeks or months in some cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we, we played a lot of Firefly games, of course, our own as well. But that kind of a weakness, it could be a strength as well, is what Costa said, is it, when you go out in your spaceship, you're only your, your small crew, and you zip around and you go to an adventure and you zip back to the base or wherever, and then you have intrigue and stuff there. And we just wanted to kind of bring along the intrigue and the people uh, on the adventure. So mm-hmm. uh, instead of just having two separate parts, you kind of meld them together a bit, and then you can have rival crews going after the same thing. You can have, uh, you know, you can have a murder mystery on the voyage. You can have a sabotage. You can have, you know, strange findings and so on. So it opens up a lot of a lot of role playing possibilities, uh, which makes it more, I think, more interactive in a way uh, than just just teleporting with a small spaceship. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. Uh... It was Star Wars that 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 can happen sometimes. It's like, okay, I'm just gonna make this hyper jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And okay, we're there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, what was your? Question? Oh, I was just gonna say that uh, you know exploration in space is clearly dangerous in itself, right? But you guys aren't happy with that. You've thrown something else in there, waiting for people, right? Did you guys want to talk about the uh, the blight? Sure. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the blight is this strange kind of growth that uh, exists down in the ancient ruins of the portal builders. And the the more kind of uh, rare ruins, the more kind of valuable stuff there is, the more blight there is. So it has some kind of connection to what was once there. And the mm-hmm. blight is uh, it's like a mix of radiation and of poisonous ivy and of... Um, not body horror, and it's not that. But if you've seen um, Jeff Wondermere's Annihilation, this kind of yeah. organic kind of weirdness. Um, so this frames the ruins uh, and these old sites when you explore them. You have this blight phenomena to always kind of be aware of because it's very it's very dangerous, and it has some mystical kind of strangeness to it. To it. Uh, so you can end up in strange places if you're too exposed to it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the bl- so we built that into the rules a lot. So you, now you have blight protection. You have to wear suits like divers, basically, to to mm-hmm. uh, and maybe sanitize yourself or turn back to a base camp to heal up. But you also have the bird now, which is the mystical part <laughs> of the game, which can counter the blight in some cases. Yeah, so so it's it's a and it's, this is all tied to kind of the meta plot and to the, the history of the setting and so on. Uh, but it's a way of making uh, these ruins and this uh, the player characters being kind of these expert divers and explorers. So they can they are one of the few that can brave this blight and go out and do this dangerous stuff. Much like deep sea divers in say the fifties or sixties with these huge suits. Um, so this is that's one part, and blight is very dangerous. And people in the ship city that the core they're afraid of blight coming to that because it's contagious and it corrupts stuff. Uh, so there's lots of plots you can do on with the blight that is not part of delving or ruin hunting. You can have it in other parts. Um, there's going to be sicknesses tied to it. Uh, some factions actually look for blight because they can do drugs from it. They can do other stuff. Uh, okay. It's a it's a plot point. It's like uh, melange, the spice in Dune, but a bit yeah. more dangerous. Yeah, I was thinking, um, uh, uh, gosh, whatever that stuff altered. Car- Remember the there's the show Altered Carbon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that proto whatever molecule getting vibes yeah, from yeah. that or, yeah, no, no, okay. So and the, now the birds, yeah. So explain the bird. So they are sort of a, a mystical. They're sort of a phenomenon as well, right? And that's every it's actual party. bird. Right, right, and it's right. That's the thing too. It's like, well, like it's a bird, like a lot, you know. And but they're not, um, they're, not, they're not real birds. No, they look like birds. Yeah, but right. Some but sort they're of construct uh, biological entity. Mm. They were found. And, and, when humanity came here. They were they found these birds, and they have a very specific purpose, as if someone left it to someone to discover. 
And as I understand what I read, each group, that'll be part of a, a, every group will have a bird and that that bird can be developed, right? Yeah. There yeah. will be rules to develop. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, you know. We have something like that called Miserable Beast. It's a, it's a mystical donkey. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't protect anybody. <laughs> but it's basically a canary bird from a gas mine, basically. But this one yeah. is a bit cooler, and it has mystical powers. Yeah. And it is somehow tied to the blight, but it can counter the blight. Yeah. And mm. its powers is, is constructed to kind of battle the, the blight. That's why it's so important for explorer groups to have a bird because without the bird, it's super dangerous to do that. But the bird helps helps the groups. Yeah. Uh, so, so whose idea was the bird, in, and did it strictly come from the canary in a coal mine type uh, uh, idea? That's our illustrator, Martin Gri. Yeah, we, we saw pictures of uh, what do you call them, uh, falconers. Yeah, with oh, yeah. birds. Mm-hmm. So that's. Uh, I think it was Cossacks. With but, birds, but it's, think, yeah, it ties but, uh, back to mm. kind of the vision of Coriolis that Coriolis is kind of, it's not hard sci fi, it's not space opera. It's science fiction that meets kind of mythology. And the birds is kind of a mytho- m- m- mythical uh, beast in this case, yeah. which mm-hmm. makes it uh, feel like a bit different than, for example, you know, Star Wars or Alien. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it's kind of uh, a way of building atmosphere as well. Yeah. And, and it's also tied to the mystical powers in the Lost Horizon. In the Third Horizon, the players could have mystical powers. They might they might develop them. Who knows? In 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 when you play the Great Dark, but in the beginning, nobody has mystical powers. Yeah. So that's contained in the birds. That was that was mm. one part of the old game we weren't really satisfied with how mystical powers worked. So we tried to make a better version in this one, uh, and mm. most of it will be discovered during play. Yeah. Um, but the bird is kind of the first manifestation of this. So when we talked to um, uh, Thomas Harenstam about uh, uh, Mutant Year Zero, I I asked him about uh, lessons learned because he was kind of floating the idea of maybe there'll be another (laughs) uh, second edition of that. Um, Besides the mysticality, what are some of the other lessons learned that you're you're changing from the the first edition, Third Horizon, to, to the Third loads. Edition. Yeah, we're, we're changing edition. loads. So, yeah. but but one big part we're changing is that we're merging talents and skills to one group called mm-hmm. talents now, uh, and they con- and they are more specialized, not as broad as they used to be in Year Zero Engine or in Old Coriolis. So right. you have a lot of more choices, and you can specialize in stuff that other people won't be able uh, or be as good as you in. But you also have higher levels in your attributes, so you can do a lot with just attributes without being, you know, uh, a loser. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's always this classic problem: if you have too many skills, uh, then of course some PCs will lack some important skills, and then you would be very, very bad at it. So we we, we raised the attributes and made the, the skills tighter, but more descriptive. Yeah. And that's also to make the characters a bit more memorable and a bit more specific. So the talents kind of are, can be used to describe uh, yeah. a character in this game. So we're not just, uh, I'm a pilot two and he's a pilot three. Yeah. Uh, and this is like, something more. Yeah. So that, that's one of the changes. Uh, in the old game, we had darkness points, which was his meta mm-hmm. currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was a cool idea, but it had some problems with it. Um, Namely that you could, because it basically, it gave, when you push roles, it gave the GM darkness points that you can use to create bad stuff, oh, yeah. uh, which is cool. But the problem is, yeah. if you don't have any darkness points, it's tricky to introduce bad stuff, and you still want to do that sometimes. So it's kind of, it can tie the GM in a strange yeah. kind of loop that yeah. sometimes doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, so we scrapped that uh, and focused on other parts here uh, and tied the pushing mechanic to hope instead. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned hope. So I was going through the um, character sheets and kind of doing some comparisons. I noticed, right. So skills are, are out that the talent system, there are more attributes, right? We've yep, added yep. a couple attributes, but then I, I noticed that you have um, hope and heart are, are, yes. are, are two. Uh, and, I, and I know earlier you mentioned about kind of this idea of having a goal uh, of being able to like achieve something better for your, your group and all this. And I was kind of curious about the hope and heart and, and how you guys use this in this. I, I know when Nathan and I were at Gen Con last year, we ran into a few different uh, game developers. 
where like hope, heart, positive, you know, so much like in the future is like dystopian, but we started seeing creators wanting to provide good outcomes, right? right? Things that, that make you, you know, that's, it's all depressing. And I'm wondering this sort of hope, the heart, how is this tied in, in your game? How do you see people using these, the, these attributes and, and, and like, how are they tied in with like their goals? As you said, it's it's uh, it's true that I mean why we introduced hope and heart and, and that stuff is because this it is a pretty dark set, setting. It's mm-hmm. a wild, it's greedy, it's dangerous. So, but if you only paint everything in one tone, it gets kind of monotonous. So we wanted to mm-hmm. contrast that with something that is more hopeful, that is more optimistic. And so this game is about uh, finding a way forward, even against all odds and so on. Uh, th- those tracks, health and hope. Uh, no, there's three tracks actually. There's health, uh, there's hope, and there's heart. Uh, and the game, kind of game loop, if you want, is kind of centered about the slow attrition of these. So exploration is more about the attrition about something that slowly they're they're chipping away at those, and you kind of feel like, oh, we got to take a break zone because uh, this guy is uh, has broken his leg and he's out of uh, air and so on. Um, and so we use these three tracks to kind of create this constant push on the players from the environment, from enemies, uh, and from other stuff to kind of uh, feed, create this pressure yeah. uh, on players when they're out in these dangerous situations. Yeah. So um, they, they, they start at a starting level. And then yeah. so the idea is that as they go through these sort of tough situations, these are reduced at some point, yeah. they have to... They have to return. They have to, you know, you have to come yeah. up for air. You have to, you know, whatever that means. There's a way to recover those. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Here's a way yeah. to recover. And basically, you can strike camps. You can help each other. You can use hope to help other. You can kind of strike, uh, you know, rally, yeah. morale, and so on. Mm. Uh, so there's there's a lot about helping each other to to recover and and push on. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of, I mean, it's not the game is not about mountaineering or deep sea diving, but it's kind of the same feeling that you know. One person is falling behind. The other ones need to kind of bring him or her up and, you know, help them. Mm. Um, this is like a contrast to a game like Alien, for example. <laughs> Alien, I mean, is a great game of stabbing your friend in the back <laughs> and dying in the process. Uh, so this game is more, more hopeful, and that's yeah. very intentional. And, that, and, and the hope track is also your resource for pushing. So if you have hope, you can push. You can give hope mm. to other members of the crew to help them. But if you're lost hope, you're desperate and, and you have to stop or turn back. And heart goes down when the blight affects you. And, and, and if you finally get broken by the blight, you go down to zero, weird stuff happen. Yeah. So they're all, health is tied to combat and damage. Uh, hope is tied to pushing on and uh, horrors and stuff and stress. And uh, as Costa said, heart is tied to blight especially. And mysteries and mystical things. Yeah. So, uh, been following Free League for a while. I I, I kind of see this as an, uh, the the eventual track is that that uh, you're gonna release uh, probably campaigns that uh, kind of uh, start to uncover the mystery of what the blight is and what happened to the people that created the portals. Is, is that kind of where we're going with this down the road? Yeah. 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 Definitely. That's exactly. So you find about you with the first campaign, you will fi- learn about one mystery and solve that, but that will uncover another mystery for the mm-hmm. second campaign. Yeah. And, and the, the third. And that's a big <laughs> lesson we learned with the old Coriolis was we, we did this huge campaign. Uh, but instead of, you know, exposing the mysteries for the players, it's lots and lots and lots of background, lots of uh, front loading with stuff for the GM. Uh, but what gets to the players is a, is a trickle of this cool stuff. So we wanted to change mm-hmm. how we write campaigns and make it more kind of player facing. Mm-hmm. So you get quicker to the cool stuff without, you know, it shouldn't be forced in any way. But um, so the campaigns we construct for this one are uh, smaller in scope, uh, but they they come to kind of the game juice a bit quicker. Yeah. And they come to a conclusion. I mean, in the old games, you had, you know, one campaign book every year or every second year. So you have to wait five years to conclude the campaign. Yeah. Here you will get right. the campaign 
when you buy the game now, you will play mm-hmm. through it, and the next year we will get a new campaign. Yeah, but they're tied together, but in a loose sense. Uh, okay. So that that way you don't have gaming groups that kind of like, oh, we can't play this because we're waiting two years for Free League to get her act together. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's a different way of of. Uh, creating adventures and campaign for this game. Uh, and also one thing uh, I've seen too, with a lot of the uh, third party licensing stuff that's been going on the past couple of years with, with uh, uh, role playing games. Uh, is there going to be a, a third party license where, where folks can create their own Coriolis uh, material? Yeah. Yep. We're going to do that. We're going to do that for both games actually. Uh, mm-hmm. So for Coriolis the Third Horizon, we will have an open gaming license. For mm-hmm. A lot of people are already creating in the Free League workshop, and we want people to continue creating stuff for the Third Horizon. We won't be developing it any further, right. but but it's uh, a lot of people love the setting, and they will probably continue. You can still play it, uh, and it's, it still has lots of... I mean, you have you have years of play in that setting, if you like. So this kind of passing on the torch to the fan base who are already doing lots of stuff for that. Yeah. Um, and, so. we'll, and we'll also have an OGL for Coriolis, The Great Dark. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're both uh, the same sort of uh, license as we've had for Dragonbane, which is uh, it's turned out very good. Yeah, so it's basically yeah. You, you, don't, you can use uh, the, the world, the setting, the rules, and write, create your own products and you don't pay anything to us. Uh, the only there's one uh, thing you 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 still need to ha- use the core rules. That's it. But you yeah. can create your own campaign. You right. can create your own source book or whatever. Yeah, and you you can kickstart your campaign and yeah. you can sell it and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a way to invite kind of the community, uh, the ones that are interested in, in doing that to kind of you know do something more with their ideas. I think that really really helps because there's uh, I. I bought like a, a a ton of treasure cards for Dragon Bane from this, yeah. uh, Philip Reed, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's been uh, just all the excitement. And and there's uh, I backed another Kickstarter from for, for Dragon Bane also. It, it, there's there's just a lot of excitement when when people can like take your foundation and add their own spin to it because uh, like the the mechanic stuff or is and getting those right is is super hard for anybody who's just starting out, but a lot of people have great imaginations and, and you're very talented with, with art and, and layout and design and they can do all that stuff. But, but uh, you know, just building on what you created is, is a kind of a, a way for them to, to fulfill those dreams of, of, of working in the, in the uh, RPG. Yeah. Industry. So and I think that's also cool. one of the cool parts with RPGs. It's like, it's this fundamentally creative uh, hobby where people, mm-hmm. I mean, just by playing, you create stuff, but, you know, writing down notes or thinking about adventures and campaigns. And that's how it started for us. We started doing stuff for other companies' games. Um, and it's just a fun way of, in, uh, I think it's a, like a communal gaming experience where yeah. people do stuff that we had never thought about. And yeah. it's like, this is, their idea is better than ours. So yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Exactly. So, yeah, it's very cool. And that's what it's very fun with Dragon Bane to see that people are starting doing lots of stuff with it. There's a ton of stuff. Uh, oh, I was say, uh, so I have to, for a lot of folks, play now uh, virtually. So, VTT support plans for VTC. So I, I, know was, I saw some stuff on the uh, Kickstarter so, side, but I don't know if that was all of it. So, uh, yeah, how do you guys plan to integrate with the, the VTTs? So, Alchemy is supported right away, uh, it's queued in Kickstarter. Um, and alchemy has this kind of uh, kind of light and atmosphere heavy approach to VTTs, which suits our games pretty well. And it's not so much about advanced function, but more about building this uh, tone and atmosphere and immersion. Foundry VTT will also be it's an add-on in the Kickstarter, but that will be come as well. And Foundry is, I would say, for the more if you want a bit more crunch, a bit more tools, Foundry is the, is the choice to to go for. That's the two one that the, the main two ones we're going for right now. Uh, we'll probably add more later on, but especially for the foundry, it's, it's quite heavy to develop uh, modules for it, so it takes time and resources. Um, so we try to focus on a couple first and make them good, and then we can see if we can expand it instead of promising like all the different platforms. Uh, and just to take a step back in. Um... 
uh, dive into the the setting uh, dive uh, <laughs> into the setting uh, a little bit more. Um, there's a, a ton of factions and uh, just the the factions that are in the in Quick Start are those the same factions that are uh, in the Third Horizon, or are these all all new, or some new, some old? Well, there, there's some new and some old, and there's also a melange of the old ones into the new. So, mm. so this setting is 200 years after the, the Third Horizon. So a lot of people that were in different factions traveled to the Lost Horizon. And then when the new power players of, of Ship City developed over time, they became the new factions. But they have okay. roots in different factions. More or less. Yeah, and you, you will see that more when you go to the core, core rule book and campaigns and so on. For example, there's this uh, faction called the Black Toad, which is basically mm, yeah, a sorry. crime syndicate. And that mm. is the direct ascendant of a faction uh, which is not a, at all a crime syndicate in the Third Horizon, which basically just switched sides and became this powerhouse of kind of crime and, and intrigue and drug distribution in this game. And it makes kind of sense in the plot behind it, but it's not apparent until you kind of you know, scrape away under the surface. Yeah. So it's they're connected, but it's not obvious. It's not like this became this, this became this, and these are the good guys or bad guys. It's kind of intermingled. Neat. So, um, and uh, one thing I, I I wanted to touch on earlier too was um, uh, the characters. What type of archetypes uh, are are going to be uh, featured in this game? So the, the ones you would expect. So, you, so we have developed different archetypes and each archetype has previous occupations. But when mm -hmm. you start the game, you, you move into the Explorer Guild and become a, a professional explorer. So your archetype mm -hmm. is your background. So you could be an enforcer okay. or you could be a worker uh, or an artist. Uh, but the artist has different uh, previous occupations. So an enforcer could have been a guild militia uh, or a uh, private investigator. Um, artist could be a hull painter or something else. Yeah, so mm. we, we have this kind of, kind of broad <laughs> archetypes that are kind of easy to identify with because you know what a kind of soldier is. But we try to, as Coriolis, is a lot about building atmosphere and kind of going deeper than that. There's the previous occupation, the custom mentors, they're full of this cultural flavor uh, so mm -hmm. all of those have a, a lot more kind of um, unique yeah. takes on different, uh, different and integrated to the settings. Yeah, so. yeah. So you won't you won't never be like I'm an artist, you're a soldier, and I'm a medic. That's not how you play this game. You have the specific ties to the setting, uh, which is makes we think for like fuller characters. But that's not that's not in the quick start. That's something that would be in the rule book, and yeah. actually, right. we're right. writing that part right now. Yeah. So we will have a, a, a extensive character generation chapter where you you get your previous occupations, you get your heirloom from the Third Horizon, you mm -hmm. you develop what uh, district in Ship City you grew up in, or in the far colonies or wherever. A, a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a life path in miniature almost system where you get like okay. That's, you, you beat me to it. So that's <laughs> it. Really sounds a little bit like kind of the Twilight two thousand. Yeah, but this is this is more streamlined and less yeah. detailed, yeah. but kind of mm -hmm. the same thing that you want to have. I grew up here. I became this. This is where I am now. This is my stuff. This is why I'm going. And each of those parts of the background do they feed into the talents that they that the characters get, or there's yeah. is that talents, yeah. talents and equipment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And also, as Costa, Costa mentioned, there's this uh, as the technology in in this game is less advanced than the former game because of the scarcity of uh, rep, uh, mm -hmm. repair parts and so on, uh, spare parts. So uh, heirlooms from the old Third Horizon are really, really valued. So you have this different. You can have weapons. You can have uh, you know scanners or yeah. different stuff mm -hmm. that that you inherited uh, from some relative or something that comes from and has a backstory tied to the old game and it also has a powerful function. So technology is more rare, but more, uh, it's, it's not magic in any way, no. but it, it's, it's more like when you have something that is really good at something, it's more special yeah. in this game. And also yeah. it breaks down like it does in the original Mutant Zero game. Yeah. I so, saw so that there's a mechanic if you push with an item, right? Yeah. You can, for every one, right? You, you, it reduces yeah. its durability or its, its yeah. level, right? Yeah. And that's, that's also to push the kind of scarcity theme that uh, equipment, uh, 
breaks and you have to you know repair it you have to pull your resources and so on and which makes uh, exploration and different parts yeah. more uh, yeah. dangerous in a way so you're climbing down the shaft into a ruin and and you have to push your climbing and you used your harpoon gun and it sort of breaks down so next time it will be harder to cross the yeah or you or you would have to strike camp and repair it and then you, you know you waste air and stuff <laughs> so it's uh Technology is a, a bit different, but it's kind of the same vibe, but more more scarce. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes for a, a, a grittier setting. It's it's a uh, you know when you think about you know some games and you, and you look at the the characters and they're just you know kitted out to the hilt with like every piece of gear they'll ever need on their back, and <laughs> and uh, I, I definitely like a a more uh, scarce type situation where where they the 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 players have to kind of fight for every little thing that they that they get and it's it's uh you know makes things a, l- a little bit harder than my, like kind of like the, uh, the the die hard approach where yeah. you know <laughs> and i think it comes back to player choice because if you if you have access to all the cool stuff from the beginning if you have everything well there's no reason not to pick the best stuff or have the best yeah. you have to have some trade off or something to make you uh, I mean, you can do that with other stuff. You can do that with encumbrance, or, or we do that yeah. in this game as well. But it's it's more fun, we think, to have this kind of. Uh, you have a spear gun. I have a this staff, but it's good for the bird. Uh, it's not a game about always having the best weapons. It's having the best tools for what you're doing in that particular moment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if you if you have everything, why would you go out exploring? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's always a thin line with sci-fi, is because. You know, high technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? So if yeah, everyone yeah. can fly and everyone can see in the dark, and you know, yeah. it's where's the danger? You know, and so yeah, yeah having that. It's like cell phones in modern horror movies or something. If you have a cell phone, you can always call for help, but they never do because. So right. you have to kind of it, find a way around that. Uh, right, Home Alone, that old movie, Home Alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? he couldn't call, yeah. right? If you, you couldn't make that movie today, right? No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You have see them on their true. camera, you know? It's like, yeah, yeah no, so, no, well, I got you. Technology is cool, but it can also put, you know, uh, it could uh, stop this kind of thoughts of adventure if it's too powerful. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's core tenet is to make our life easier. That's not yeah. fun. Yeah. That's not an adventure, yeah. right? You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And well, like Wally and those floating chairs, and yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so your your uh, the campaign is close to wrapping up. I think um, we're uh, shooting this on a Thursday. I think you've got a, about a week left. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any and all, all are all the stretch goals met yet, or they are still some stuff? Yeah, yeah. but we're gonna add a few more tomorrow. Yeah, uh, we had ooh, some. Okay. In, we used to, in the pipeline. Yeah, but we mm-hmm. have to figure out exactly what. Because yeah, in what order? We're not uh, in agreement over this. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so you all guys, right, you guys right are a <laughs> dirty trick to throw dices. And I, I, I went in. We did the Kickstarter today, and uh, I got done. I was like, okay. And then it's like, would you like to add dice? I'm like, oh, <laughs> come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, yes, you do want dice. dice. <laughs> in the box already. Well, yeah. I've got another set coming because you can never yeah, have yeah, any yeah. dice. <laughs> too many. No. Well, you, you kind of, uh, today actually we unlocked uh, the solo rules, which is going to be into the core uh, mm. book. And that's going to be written by Sean Tomkin and Matt Click. And Sean Tomkin has written these really, really good solo rules for uh, Iron Sworn and Starforged. Oh, okay. And stuff yeah, those are really popular. Well. So we're really excited. And he's he's been looking at the game and kind of see where he can do some solo things. So that's going to be really cool that you can you can play. This is the first time you can play like solo in Coriolis. Yeah. Oh, cool. uh, so I think it's cool. and that's and that's something that I've seen in in uh, a lot of other freely games recently. And it's, uh, solo gaming is is uh, um, becoming a lot more uh, popular now. It's huge yeah. demand for that. It's, yeah. I mean, from our customers, it's like if we don't do a solo mode, people are upset. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was surprised to discover that. I mean, so I when I was young, I when they when they couldn't get a game, I'd done it. I just didn't know that. You know, it's like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm the guy who can't find anyone to game this weekend, right? But then you find out there's tons of people who, yeah. right, for life circumstances, can't yeah. get a regular group or whatever, and so yeah. I play. And so, yeah, I totally applaud it. I think it's a great addition to the game. 
you know, yeah, I think a lot of, we all love the stories. Have a limited amount of time, and they maybe yeah. have you know kind of kids and stuff or careers, and this is a way for them to kind of interact with the game mm-hmm. uh, anyway. And I think that, I think that's great. Uh, but I mean, I'll, we always prefer to play, of yeah. course. Yeah, we play yeah. in real life. Yeah, most yeah, times. Yeah. But uh, all and, times. Anyway, I mean, the old Traveler game was, like, I think, was a pioneer in this because you could roll your characters. You could you could create starships. You could create systems, and you can just mm-hmm. roll on tables and create your own stuff, which I did as a kid. And I think that's kind of cool that you can still interact with the game. Good way to learn a game too, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good way to get yeah. the grips on the on the system and the, the setting. So, and and when do you expect this to be fulfilled? Do you think uh, early mm-hmm. or first quarter of twenty five? Yeah, but we will have an mm-hmm. alpha this fall. Yeah, so an alpha okay. of the full game and of the campaign uh, will will drop in this autumn, so people can start mm-hmm. playing uh, already this year. But the full release will be in March, I think. Yes, yeah, that's what we did with with Twilight Two Thousand. We we started with the Alpha, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was like it was like ninety nine percent there. There's a, a few things that changed at, yeah. at the end, but it, it, was, it was a lot was, of C uh, page XX. Yeah, yeah. We play test like, our own games, you know, when they're in like a pre Alpha state, and it's also it's like so we want to play with the layout and stuff, but we sit with word files, and it's like it's ugly. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's much more nice to have mm-hmm. a bit more <laughs> design to it. Mm-hmm. That's great. The, uh, Matt, do you have any other uh, uh, questions that, that we haven't uh, gone no, over that's, yet? I've got my list. I think that's it for me, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm pretty happy. This is this is really good. Uh, I, I, uh, it's always great to, to talk to designers and kind of get in their head, and like, how how did you come up with this? And, and that's pretty neat for us because it's not – not our thing. We we like playing the games. We like running the games. So it's uh, uh, and and free league has always uh, been fabulous to to us and very supportive. So again, thank you so much for for uh, everything you guys do. Uh, we we really appreciate it as, as small creators. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's like the hobby is is everything. Yeah. You're you're part of the hobby as yeah. well. It's kind thank of you. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's it's not just we're just publishers. There's yeah. <laughs> the whole the creative stuff is what makes it unique. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, awesome. Uh, so, uh, folks watching, listening, uh, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, I sure did. Uh, uh, Nils Costa, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been super fun. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, thank it's you. been fun. Thank you. And, and we'll see you guys next time. Yeah. See ya. See ya.